So I asked these panelists um, to be on the front here um, because they represent different aspects of our continent. Now, down on the very end is, uh, is my good friend Godfrey Harold. And Godfrey is not geographically oriented this morning, although he does serve in Cape Town Baptist Theological uh, Seminary. But he, um, he actually is representing the Asian Baptist perspective. Um, and he has some things to share about that. Ezra Musanda there is, uh, is in Zambia, and he's going to help us with Central Africa. And then we have Dr. Ruben Chuga, who is from Kaduna, Nigeria. That's Anglophone West Africa. We have Francophone West Africa here, who's very cold with his head covered, uh, Dr. Alabwe. And, um, <laughs> and then we have, um, representing East Africa, Reverend Kamal, and then we have Desmond Henry, and we also have Lindsay Rinquist, who are talking to us about Southern Africa. Are we, to, are, we, are we together? Are we good? Is the light in your eyes, guys? Okay, all right. Um, so I, I've got several questions that, um, that I thought um, we could go through. I've already said all this already, forgive me. Um, but, uh, but let's talk a little bit about history. Maybe, and we're probably not going to have time for everybody, and I, you can pass the mics, but tell us as best you can how theological education among Baptists began in your part of the world. In other words, what were the key places, who were the key players, and, um, and how was it characterized in terms of teaching, languages, methods, things like that? Maybe just take a few minutes and we'll start with Godfrey and we can pass the mic down. I am South African with Indian descent, uh, but I think my affiliation with India allows me the privilege of speaking to a particular context, and more specifically the fact that in 1818, William Carey uh, began Serving for College, uh, which was the first university uh, to be established uh, in India. So literally, the secular university system owes its allegiance uh, to Baptist heritage in India. So we're thankful to the Lord uh, for that. Uh, then in 1864, uh, Jewett uh, went to a place called Andhra Pradesh, Worked in Tamil Nadu for a while. In 1860, developed Baptist Central Seminary, uh, which trained John Rangia, who came to South Africa in 1904 and started the South African or the Indian Baptist uh, mission. Uh, so we have a fair amount of um, American Baptist uh, influence in the sense uh, prior to, uh, I think, the Break up, so the split. So, uh, literally, our uh, heritage comes directly from uh, American Baptist uh, through uh, Jewett and through Rangia. Uh, and then there are many uh, evangelical churches in South Africa, uh, Indian evangelical churches that are Baptistic. Uh, the South African Evangelical Church of South Africa, which has a direct influence uh, from a, a Baptist from Australia, uh, and the Evangelical Church, uh, the Evangelical Bible Church, which is also very Baptistic. And fair amount of Baptist influence. So while the Evangelical Baptist Church, uh, the Evangelical and Baptist Churches, predominantly KZN, uh, are Baptist, Evangelical, and Indian, they owe much to the influences uh, in India. Um, I trust that gives us some history. Uh, on the aspect of Central Africa, I think that uh, the story begins in 1950 and that it begins in Zimbabwe, uh, northern, I mean, southern Rhodesia at that time. And uh, I think uh, the first missionaries and the key players were the Dodsons, uh, Clyde Dodson and uh, uh, Ralph Pauline. And these are the men that were in the forefront and the leadership of the mission uh, in Zimbabwe at that time, northern, uh, southern Rhodesia. And after uh, some time, when the Dodsons had gone on holiday, uh, which we call fellow, uh, the missionaries, some that remained behind, uh, agreed that they needed to establish a seminary, uh, or a leadership training center for leaders. And they proposed Sanyati. So Sanyati is a very important place uh, among Baptists and the Southern Rhodesia. 
and uh, it was proposed that they would start a uh, seminary there. But uh, the Dodsons had already thought of one in, in, I mean, in Harare, uh, Rosebury then. But there, thereafter, they had bought land in Gweru, and that's where now they have a seminary. And uh, I can say briefly that uh, they started the seminary in 1955. And uh, after some time, they were joined by people coming from Malawi and Zambia, and they were studying there. But it happened in 1965. There was UDI, the Unilateral Declaration of Independence. The border between Zimbabwe and Zambia got closed. And so there was no access. And so it was necessary for the Zambians uh, to begin theirs. But by then, before that, there was already a mission that had already gone to start and to do a survey uh, in Zambia and Malawi and the Tunduan, just to start new work by the Baptist mission. Uh, but this was kind of a blessing uh, for the Zambian churches that uh, the UDI caused us now to have our own seminary. And so our seminary began in 1969. And uh, that was the first group of students. And then there was a, a misunderstanding between the students and the mission. And so there was a suspension of the school. But then uh, those who needed to apply, they could apply. Only one guy came back, but there were new students in September 1969, and so it continued. And up to today, that work has flourished with so many other Bible, Bible schools being added to it. And so we are so grateful. Malawi also used to send theirs to Zimbabwe, but also now start sending their students to Zambia also. So uh, that's about the, the story, uh, how it began. I speak for specifically for Nigeria, but by extension, West Africa. Baptist mission presence started in Nigeria. Now the area today called Nigeria. It wasn't Nigeria then. In 1850, the first Southern Baptist missionary, Jefferson Bowen, came to Nigeria. And if you know Nigeria, most of West Africa, to the far north uh, of that area is savanna, and the savanna grows into a desert. It was easier for Islam to come through the north, and it was faster. When you are coming from the south, it's a forest. So mission work was impeded by movement from the south to the north. Also, too, there were lots of conflicts, tribal conflict. It wasn't easy for people to move from one ethnic group to another. Even within the ethnic group that Jefferson worked with, the Yoruba, there were conflicts between them. Um, so, I say this so we understand the slow pace of movement of Christian influence from the south to the north. And how easy it was for Islam to move from the north to the south. Actually, where Islam stopped in its progression to the south was a forest. As they progressed into the forest region, they couldn't move fast. They came on horses. And so they couldn't move fast into the forest. So from Elorin downward, uh, we're going into a forest, so uh, literally stopped. And the Christian influence was slowly moving. This is just imagination. You won't find it in any history. Um, for theological education, the first theological institution we started in all of West Africa. Maybe I need to say the whole of Africa was the Now It started very simply. 
by Reverend Smith. And it started as a small school to train evangelists in 1896. And he moved from one place to another where the missionary moved, the school moved with him. He was the school. And wherever he moved, the school moved. He was the principal, he was the dean, he was the registrar, he was everything. And he was the library. So he was everything. So the school moved from place to place until it eventually settled in Ogomosho. And there it stayed till this time. It started very simply. It was to teach in Nigeria. Now, it wasn't Nigeria actually. There was no Nigeria until 1914. We're talking about 1898. So in that region of West Africa, um, the, there was no other language other than little ethnic group. So there was no language to connect the people. So he had, Smith had to learn Yoruba. Just like if you came here, you had to learn what? Swahili. And that would take you years of learning. So he had to teach himself first. Then teach the students. And he started that simple. Training evangelists. Then it progressed into a school, a formal theological school. Uh, the emphasis initially was just praying people who will understand the Bible and preach to others. It came as simply as that. They were not thinking, they were not thinking of some great theologians. They were not thinking, it's just to pass the message. That was the emphasis initially. But over time, as the colonial institutions were developing, uh, educational institution. Then there was a need to also upgrade theological education. And the seminary in Obumasho also kept growing. And the seminary in Obumasho became the first degree awarding institution in Nigeria. Uh, first degree awarding of all schools, all secular. Um, so we have, uh, we, we, we have all a history of being the first degree awarding institution in Nigeria. Baptist people have that to their credit. I think uh, Dr. Lola will help me out. Ibadan was the first Nigerian university. It started its degrees in 1958, two years after uh, Omashaw uh, offered degree. Now, over time, other theological institutions were started by the Baptist work, as the Baptist work was growing and spreading all over the country. Uh, the, the convention was started in 1914, Nigerian Baptist Convention. And the convention was growing, and there was need for training for pastors in other parts. Now, I told you, English became our official language, but English was not very popular. Not everybody could speak English. So they had to establish theological institutions in different parts of the country speaking vernacular, local language. Local languages were used in, in the training. Uh, over time, as education generally was improving in the country, theological education education among the Baptists was also growing. Now had diploma programs and developed degree programs in our theological institutions. Today, the Nigerian Baptist Convention has 10 theological institutions spread all over the country. Now the nature of Nigeria requires that schools be studied that way. And Nigeria is pretty large geographically is large in terms of population also. And it's culturally diverse. So there was, there was the need for the Nigerian Baptist Convention to start schools in this way. Uh, 
who would have had more schools, theological schools than this. But the convention had to stop at one point because of funding. Schools had to be properly funded. If we started too many, we wouldn't be able to fund them. So they stopped. At one point they said, okay, no more theological schools. So we stopped two years ago and we want to develop this one, maintain standard, fund them properly, and be able to monitor them and sustain them. This is where we are. I speak for East Africa. Uh, the Baptist mission came from Nigeria to East Africa in 1956. Uh, and in 1959, they met here in Nimuru after having planted churches in Tanzania, in Kenya. They had a problem with the, with the Uganda because uh, with Uganda because of the political situation. And when they met in the Muru in 1959, that is when they came up, came up with a resolution to start a seminary for the East African. And in 1962, the Arusha Baptist Seminary was started. And it had students from Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. However, the level of literacy in East Africa was very low. And due to that, most of the missionaries would not uh, direct uh, people, the church leaders, to the Arusha Seminary. And out of that, the missionaries decided to start what we call Bible schools, which were taught in local languages. The missionary would start a Bible school within his locality and would teach uh, the pastors who are basically literate on how to, uh, uh, to read, and most of the times they would teach them how to memorize scripture, and as they memorize scripture, then they would use that for their training or for their preaching in their churches. And therefore, in East Africa, there were several Bible schools that were started in different parts of uh, East Africa as a whole by the Baptist missionaries. The Arusha Seminary basically was training people who were literate, people who would study, or study either in Swahili or English. And the Bible schools grew, and at the same time, they came up with the uh, program, uh, biological education by extension program, also to be able to reach people who could not come to the seminary. And that, that's how the biological education among the Baptists started in East Africa. Desmond here representing the Baptist uh, work in South Africa and particularly uh, the Baptist Union of Southern Africa. In 1820, the first settlers arrived in the, on the shores of South Africa and so next year we'll be celebrating 200 years of a Baptist witness in South Africa itself. Quite a special moment. Uh, but the, the first settlers were British and uh, had an agreement with the London Missionary Society that they wouldn't do any evangelism among the local or indigenous people. And uh, so they continued for a number of years until 1954 or so uh, when the German Baptists came under the leadership of uh, someone by the name of Paul Hugo Gutscher, who within about a decade established 30 different churches debt-free uh, within pr primarily the northern, or, sorry, eastern Cape region. Uh, in 1877, the Baptist uh, Union was formed, and a lot of discussions started to formulate about how they were going to train their pastors. Most of the pastors to that point and for a lot of the history uh, were trained at Spurgeon's Bible College uh, in London and were sent to South Africa, um, again very, very much in line with their mission policy uh, as well. But in 1914, the Baptist Union finally settled particularly on uh, what a Baptist minister would look like and they had some criteria for ministerial formation and a clear idea of how that they were going to try and train those ministers as such. But ministry and ministerial formation happened largely in segregated ways. And so we see that uh, the South African Baptist Mission Society was formed um, and uh, they trained what they would call the Bantu uh, education as their focus. And so they, they, they kind of developed uh, theological education primarily for, for black people um, within our context. 
And, uh, and that, that continued through a number of different mechanisms. A number of different schools were started. The Ennals Institute was started in the Eastern Cape. Millard Institute in, in, in 1959 in, in Soweto. Fort White, others were developed. But uh, the first theological college, and one that I'm privileged to teach at, uh, was started in 1951 as the Baptist Theological College, which is located in Johannesburg. And uh, so we continue to uh, exist and will celebrate 70 years uh, in uh, two years' time of, of faithful ministry. Uh, but again, uh, we have seen a lot of changes and development in the light of how we train our ministers and, and how we work together for that. And so I'll allow my brother Lindsay, perhaps at this time, just to speak about Cape Town Baptist Seminary and, uh, and some of the things he'd like to add to this as well from Southern Africa. Thanks, Desmond. Yeah, um, so as Desmond said, there were different streams of Baptist influence in South Africa. Um, the British Baptists, the German Baptists, the Indian Baptists um, as well came along. Then between 1900 and 1950, a lot of the theological education took place on a very informal basis with ministers either being sent to England, coming from England, some of them joining what was called the Rhodes University, what was still called Rhodes University in Grahamstown, until the Baptist Seminary in Johannesburg was formed. Um, but because of this, what we might call the separate development policy that was unfortunately adopted by Baptists in South Africa, um, there were the training institutions, as is mentioned, the Mullard um, Institute and the Ennals Institute, the so-called black pastors. Um, the one in the Eastern Cape eventually developed into the Baptist Bible Institute that was closed down in the late 1980s, was actually sold to the Southern Baptist, became the Baptist International Theological Seminary. That was closed down um, as well. But our particular institution, Cape Town Baptist Seminary, was originally started um, in the mid-1970s as a branch of the Baptist College in Johannesburg. But prior to that, there was a lot of informal training that actually took place um, in Cape Town amongst the so-called um, colored people, people of mixed race origin, um, that took place informally into a semi-formal um, um, mechanism until some kind of formal theological education leading to a diploma in theology um, was started in Cape Town. So um, Cape Town started as the Western Province branch, became the Baptist Theological College Cape Town, and in 2002 became the, the Cape Town Baptist Seminary. Um, under the South African Baptist Mission Society, there were also endeavors to take theological education beyond the borders. So there were partnerships um, that developed, um, especially in Zambia, what was then known as Northern Rhodesia, so in place like Lumberland, Wally Hill, you know, there were, were partnerships in theological education. But I'm not aware of any other um, partnerships in theological education from South African Baptists um, in other parts of Southern Africa. Thank you. Let me remove my hat before. Uh, because uh, uh, in my country, you don't stand before older people with hat and hat. Okay. Uh, I will just try to, to say something about theological education in. West Africa, especially Francophone Africa, West Africa. Uh, Baptist presence in uh, Francophone countries in West Africa started with uh, uh, Yoruba people who came from Nigeria and settled in those countries. And uh, it, it was early in the uh, 20th century. At the time, they invited uh, the, the mission from the US. This was in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it was following this invitation that uh, the school has been Founded in Togo. It, it was called uh, Baptist Pastoral Institute of Togo. Uh, 
uh, his mission then was to train leaders for Baptist school in Togo. The founder was uh, Dr. Bill Bullington. The school, that school changed or uh, enlarged its vocation in 19... In 1977, and uh, it became then West West African Baptist School of Theology, and uh, started to serve all the Francophone countries in West Africa. There was then a residential program, but also uh, a theological education by extension. From 1977, the school was led by Dr. Bill Mockel. Uh, many of us, many of those who are leaders now in Baptist churches, their first contact with uh, theological education was through this theological education by extension. In 1999, following the, the change in strategy of uh, International Mission Board, uh, African leadership took over to continue the work of training. And at that time, they they, they gathered and decided how to organize pastoral and leadership training among Baptists in Francophone Africa. And they decided that one, each country, each union or convention can create an institute to train people up to the high school level. And uh, the school in Lome will remain for the whole region with higher degree. And this started actually in 1999. Uh, I was uh, among the first group, part of the first group of students when it started with the, with the program of Bachelor of Theology and also kind of diploma. It's difficult to find the correspondence really in an uh, in, uh, Anglo-Saxon system. And then from there, uh, Baptist Union in Burkina Faso, in Côte d'Ivoire, Convention in Togo and Union in Benin, each of them created an institute that still that still functioning uh, currently. And uh, the school there in uh, Lome must concentrate on on uh, higher degree. It started also a high, a high school level program to allow each Baptist union and convention to send people to Lome to be trained. And uh, after a while, this program has been stopped because each Baptist Convention and Union can now train people up to this level. In the, the school, the institute started in Benin in 2003. I was the, I, I can't say that I was the founder. The vision was not from me. The vision was there from uh, a man called Auga Auguste, who was at that time head of the Department of Education, and uh, 
I took over from him, and actually, the institute started in 2003. The Institute of Togo started in 2004. I don't keep exactly the date of the other institute, but all of them, I think, started after 2000. This is uh, briefly what I can say about theological education in West Africa, Francophone countries. So let me just ask some of you, maybe um, I'll ask, um, we'll start with Reverend Kamau. What are the current trends that you see taking place in theological education in your part of Africa? What are some things that you think today are unique, different? In East Africa, there has been a mushrooming of theological uh, education. And basically what is happening uh, within East Africa is that there are so many uh, schools from the U.S. that are coming uh, and are starting schools in different parts of uh, Kenya and Tanzania, uh, teaching people from, from within the churches. And the Baptist had already started doing that uh, before this school started. Uh, and, and this is a challenge currently in that people do not uh, care much of what they are getting hmm. apart from the paper that they are getting from whoever comes and says that they are offering theological hmm. education hmm. in this area or uh, in this part of the world. Okay. Um, Ezrin uh, Musanda, what, uh, what challenges uh, do you think Baptists are facing today in theological education? Uh, we have several uh, challenges. And uh, uh, mainly uh, it has to do with the finances and the cost of education. Mm. And uh, I think that it should be the, the major aspect because uh, one, in the first place, our students are not able uh, to fund their own education. Uh, it's amazing because they can find money to go to secular institutions, <laughs> but they are not able to find money for theological education. Amen. So that is something that is surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we, we are having that challenge because I think from history, from history when the mission began theological education, it began with a lot of subsidy. Mm, mm. And uh, what happened was that the, the earlier students received free education. And they had the free supplies of food and lots of other incentives. Mm -hmm. Now, when these graduates came out of seminary, they were thinking it was the same. When we asked for money, they were saying, what are they asking? They are trying to steal money from you. Mm -hmm. Because we went through free of charge. Yeah. And the mission is able to pay. And especially when the mission staff on the faculty, they still think that the mission is still funding theological education. Mm -hmm. And that has become a big, big challenge for us. Okay. Because the very people that they are supposed to be promoting as the alumni, Mm. promoting the support of the institution are the very ones saying, well, they are stealing money from you. Mm. Mm. They are not supposed to charge you that much. Okay. We didn't pay anything. Mm. And mm. so that is one challenge. Mm. Thank you. And uh, the second one, we have universities, uh, you know, mushrooming all over. Mm. And uh, lots of people are going there and there is a competition. But, we still are going on. Uh, we have not stopped because others are appreciating our work. And we have many of the Pentecostals appreciating what we have been doing. And so we have, among the student body, people that are coming from these other denominations because they know that the way we handle the Word of God mm -hmm. is the best way that anyone can. Mm. And so they are coming. So that is a plus for us. Okay. But the challenge 
that I still find is not being able to understand the attitude of the alumni. Okay. To me, that is baffling. Mm. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, I was going to ask uh, Dr. Harold. Um, tell us um, what what are some progress and victories that you're seeing personally in theological education. Personally, in India, uh, I think uh, listening to some of my colleagues. There's a new model that's come out called the Sadhu model. Mm -hmm. They found that there's been this disparity between scholarship and spirituality. Okay. Because most of the theological institutions, and we've got seven Baptist institutions in India out of the 107 accredited evangelical institutions, and they found that, and most of the theological institutions are situated in the city. And so when the villagers come into the city, they get drawn in by the light of the city and after training want to stay in mm -hmm. the city and not go back home. I think we all face that dilemma in the city. Um, and so they developed this, this model called the Southern model where instead of taking, bringing the student to seminary, they take the seminary to the church. Okay. Uh, and they sit, rather spend three years with the student under supervision of a senior pastor. Mm. Uh, basic theological education and after a year and a half, person under tutor, uh, under discipleship will then have to found a church and three years later has to pastor the church and within five years enable the church to become self okay. sustainable. So for me that's very interesting development. It's because of that development there's been a flourishing of new churches uh, in, in India. Okay. I think the government is not very pleased with regards to that. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, let's let's ask uh, Dr. Rinquist here. Um, and by the way, I noticed when he took the hat off, he said, "I think he said he thought you were older." That's what I, I heard. I don't know which is which. Lindsay, tell us this: Is there a need? This is an important question. I think is there a need for a specific Baptist voice in theological education? Or is it enough for churches to just send their leaders to good evangelical schools? I personally think that there's a need for both. Um, I think the, the Baptist brand of theological education is a very, very important one. And I think we, we often sell ourselves short and also underestimate um, what Baptist distinctives you know, could mean for the growing church in, in Africa, um, even in Southern Africa, you know, when you think about um, the way in which that growth is taking place, you know, so you have heard it been said before, you know, they say that um, Christianity in Africa is a mile wide and a few inches deep. Um, and I think given the, the, the influence of various forms of Christianity, you know, we call it sometimes neo-Pentecostal, independent churches, etc., etc., etc. There's this kind of um, new form of Christianity, this popular form of Christianity, um, prosperity gospel kind of Christianity that is having a very strong foothold. And I think that having a good Baptist theological education um, will hopefully inoculate us against that. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, yes, please, please do. You know, evangelical, the word evangelical is becoming a little porous. Hmm. And there are so many groups that claim to be evangelical, but we will not really accept them as Baptist. Okay. So I strongly, very, very strongly feel the need for our own distinctives. Okay. Training our people in our own theological institutions. Okay. Now, for Baptists in Nigeria, you are not allowed to pastor a Baptist church, Nigerian Baptist Convention church, unless you have attended a Baptist theological institute. Wow. You could have all your training in some evangelical school or schools, but you will not pastor a Baptist church hmm. in Nigeria. Hmm. You must go back to a Baptist theological institution for at least two years. Wow. 
Well, well, keep keep the microphone because I want to ask you another question. Yeah. Um, what do we need to keep doing? What, what what are we doing right in Baptist theological education that we need to continue? I think that we're maintaining standards. We should keep doing that. Let's not lower standards because we want to meet, we want to open the doors for everybody. That's the first thing. We must maintain our distinctives. And we must keep to this. Uh, this is not directly from the question. Some years ago, the Nigerian Baptist Convention was very, very involved with theological education by extension. It was a big thing, and it was coming up real big in the Nigerian Baptist Convention. And all of a sudden, it died. Why? We train people through theological education by extension because there were so many churches that did not have pastors. So we needed to train lay leaders to help those churches. But when we train those lay leaders through theological education by extension, we said, okay, if you actually want to become a pastor after going through TEE, you have to go to a formal theological institution. But most of those we trained through TEE wanted to become pastors and be ordained. So they say, here we have a, a certificate. Why can't we be ordained? It became a problem. Mm -hmm. I think certificates are becoming too... Um, the purpose is certificate, ordination. We just want to do it so fast. We... We have in Nigeria, all the theological institutions in Nigeria are Baptist theological institutions. Have a coordinating body. We have um, the, the ministerial training board. It coordinates and maintains standards for all the Baptist theological institutions in Nigeria. I think we should continue to do that. And we, it also has an accrediting council, which accredits, or if you don't meet standards, they say you have been de-accredited. And we need to maintain that. Hmm. The collaboration, maintenance of standards. Uh, and I think we should cut down the number of students we take in too. Maybe I'm speaking only for Nigeria. Our theological institutions are getting larger and larger and larger. Um, I think Obomajo has about a thousand students, about a thousand two hundred students. That's large for theological education. <laughs> Everyone in here is thinking, "Wow, we want that. <laughs> we want that." <laughs> now, Dr. Audi's institution has close to five hundred. <laughs> as a Baptist seminary in Kaduna, yeah. as about 500. Well, that's too large. Hmm. Because theological education is mentoring. We've done this for a long time. We've mentored. That's good. Student. Say that again. Theological education is what? It's mentoring. Mentoring. That's good. And a mentoring is best when you have a small number. Hmm. And it gets too large. Hmm. It just becomes giving certificates to people. We'll go through it. Let me ask um, Director Alabwe, um, what should we do differently? What do you think we need to stop doing or change? Can you hand him the mic? Okay. What should we do differently? I think uh, recently in our school we we went through a revision of our curriculum mm. because we felt that uh, the curriculum was too, let's say, theoretical. Uh, it didn't deal really with uh, uh, crucial issues uh, in our society, so we we tried to to remove some courses and to introduce some new courses 
then I think that the whole the whole mindset that is uh, presiding to our our leadership training theological training should uh, should change okay the whole mindset that uh, that leaders in doing theological education uh, because we, we need to to meet the needs that are on ground hmm. and uh, our theological education should be more transformative and this is the one the, the, the bigger thing I think we we, we should uh, be willing to change but I know uh, it's very difficult we we we've been using this mindset for a long time we've been trained in that and how can we now uh, change this mindset mm. and be willing to to do what is actually relevant to our context. Okay, yes. so more contextual. Would you say more African and less Western? Yes, because we are, uh, uh, I, I often say to the student, are you going to minister in the US or, <laughs> or, or in France or in somewhere else outside Africa? That's if good. it's your vocation, then you can still you can still go with all this stuff that we we just try to memorize and repeat uh, uh, right now and i say our theological education now talking about uh, do you call it efficiency in english i don't know uh, what we put in our theological education is very is very big, mm -hmm. but the result is not that the impact is not that that uh, uh, significant. So we need to to do theological education in a way that the graduates they can speak to their own people in a way that they can understand and live out. Mm -hmm. The word of God. Okay. Right now, we are more prestigious. We, it's like uh, we look more after we 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 run more after prestige. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to to be people with bachelor, with masters, with PhD, and uh, uh, we forget about uh, the real work. Mm -hmm. What the Lord interest of us. Okay. Let me give the last one and the hardest one to Desmond Henry. Okay. I, I think that there's a part that some things we should do slightly different. We train people and we just, it's like training a medical doctor. He's finished his class work and they send him straight to the theater with a very serious case mm. to deal with by himself. Training in theological institutions is good, but I think that some kind of working under a pastor mm. who is in the field already to be part of theological training. We try to integrate it in Nigeria, that every student from his second year in seminary is attached to a local job. But I think we can add to that. Maybe the last semester, one whole semester, we can attach students, final year students also. Let them work with pastors. Let them get credit for it. Mm. Working, go work with a pastor. Stay with him. You are an associate pastor for one semester. Work there. Mm. When you do that, we give you credit for it. Practice to also attract credit. Mm. I think so. Okay. Because it is too, it's too fast for many of them. Mm. You just finished theological training today, tomorrow you are senior pastor. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Just the next day. Sure. I think it's too big a jump. Okay. Uh, let me ask the man from Johannesburg. You need to be a prophet right now if you can change your title. And uh, we need to know what does the future hold for Baptists and for theological education? What do you think will come in the future? Great question. I'm not a prophet. Okay. Or a son of a prophet. <laughs> I do work for a non-profit, right? Um, <laughs> what does the future hold? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. I think in our context, particularly what we've seen is a, a definite trend online rather mm. than on site. Mm. And so for every one student on campus, we now have five students online. Um, and so that's, that's really great. And so we've partnered with some institutions. Uh, we've built our first uh, video recording uh, studio on site. And so we record all of our lectures and put it online and have uh, a great online program. I think there's more to be said and done in terms of the use of technology in theological education, uh, but it has its limitations, mm. uh, which we do understand. Now, the other aspect that I think we need to look at is, uh, again, the, the training of, of lay leaders, as was mentioned earlier, that's going to become increasingly important, and probably a two out of every five students that we have uh, are there to be trained uh, from the local church base. And so elders, deacons, people who serve in the leadership of the church, and uh, so that's, that's a great blessing as we see them coming in, uh, particularly in our highest certificate of ministry and highest certificate of theology programs, which are one-year programs, they're being trained and, uh, and kind of feel that that is a, an adequate preparation to help them engage at local church level as well. I think also that's helpful to our Baptist churches because a lot of people coming to our Baptist churches may come from Pentecostal churches or other so-called evangelical churches, and these studies really help ground them and root them mm. uh, in terms of Baptist distinctives. Another trend that we're seeing, uh, equal to what you were saying in your context there, my friend, is uh, Relating to um, the, uh, the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement, uh, 65% of our student body, as an example, is now not Baptist. Mm. And uh, pri- primarily Pentecostal, Charismatic, uh, some Methodist as well, interestingly, um, and uh, one or two other denominations, AFM, Assemblies of God. And uh, they come to us for training because, one, we're accredited. And so in our, in our constituency, accreditation... Uh, through the government agency of the Council on Higher Education is a big thing. And I think this is going to become an increasing necessity throughout Africa, uh, where because of the proliferation of these uh, colleges from the U.S. and from everywhere else uh, on earth coming to offer degrees, charging people money uh, for giving them substandard, sub-quality degrees um, sort of overnight, um, there's going to be a lot more regulation in terms of this in the future. So we're going to have to learn how to cope with that and maintain high standards and ethical standards of practice and pedagogy, which I think are important as well. But I do think that uh, indicative of where we are now, uh, a great sign of what we face in the future is unity. We're better together than we are apart, right? And so unity is important. And we're seeing this in our constituency, even between our Baptist seminaries in South Africa uh, and Baptist factions, as an example, uh, the Afrikaans Baptist Seminary and the Baptist Convention of South Africa, which is uh, primarily black, which left the Baptist Union uh, a couple of decades ago, are all now, in the last four years, have come and are training their pastors through uh, BTC, Amen. which is a wonderful thing. So we're seeing there's a, a definite unity mm. um, of that's different uh, groups and factions that's happening uh, in our generation, and that's something that we can certainly work uh, on and, and improve going into the future. Amen. Thank you. Can you give these experts a big hand, please? <clears throat>